What's your name? Zach. Zach. Hi, Zach. Um, do you like tomato sauce on your food? Sometimes. Sometimes. Well, I've got a very special drink for you today. <laughs> so. Oh, that looks really good. Oh, never comes out of the bottle, does it? What's wrong with it? Tomato sauce does this. He said, Zach said he likes tomato sauce. You heard him, so. All right, do you think that looks like a good drink? No? No, of course not. We'd make it better. Um, this is... What does that say? Sriracha. It's hot chilli sauce. It's hot chilli sauce. Sriracha. Do you reckon you'd like some of that, Nezak? Here we go. Oh, that comes out. That comes out better. It's not working. <laughs> that looks so good, do you think? I think? What do you reckon, Zach? Do you want to drink it? Yes. <laughs> yes and no. Well, I'll tell you what. I've got an idea. Do you like tropical fruit juice? Do you want to just check that that's real? Like that, you know, check, open it, it's, check it's like. Is that a new bottle? Yeah. Yep. Okay, so how about put this in, in here and I'll do you a deal, Zach. Someone has to drink that cup. We're not going until that cup's been drunk. But what if I drank that for you and you drink this one? I'd be happy. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, let's drink. <laughs> Going well there, Zach. <laughs> Goodness. <laughs> Didn't bring a survey yet. Thank you, Zach. Can Go back and sit down. You want the rest of the bottle? <laughs> there we go. Yes. And, I mean, that's, you know, might seem a bit silly, but the reality is is that there's two cups in front of each of us. And... Oh, two microphones as well. And um, we're going to have to make a choice as to which cup we would like to drink from. So, first of all, I want to talk about this from Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 to 12. And this really talks about the cups that are in front of us and our choice. I'm going to read to you from Revelation chapter 14, Verse 6. It says, Then I saw another angel flying in mid heaven with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who live on the earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. If we could have the next slide. I didn't bring the clicker, sorry. And so this first, this is, you might know this passage as the three angels' messages, is what we often tend to call it. So this verse 6 is the first angel. And this angel has a message. It says the message is the eternal gospel. Now, does anyone know what gospel actually means? Good news. So, Jan today was telling us that she's got some good news from her doctor. Wondering what the best news anyone here might have had is. Has anyone got some good news in their life? That's not promising. The birth of a baby, maybe someone's had a, a grandchild or a child come into their family recently. Sorry, what was that? Daughter moving into a new house, that's good news. Yeah, or perhaps um, we have had good news from, from a doctor. I remember when my son Blake 
was a baby, we were told that um, they were fairly sure he had cystic fibrosis. And um, we went through a series of tests then. And at the end of those tests, they told us that he didn't. And so that was very good news. So we get good news in many different forms, but this angel comes bringing good news. And we're told that the good news this angel brings, it's for everybody. And the good news that this angel brings is, is the gospel, is the good news of Jesus. It's the message that he came and he lived as a human and he died in our place and was raised again so that we might have life in him. And that's, that's the best news ever that this angel's bringing. But this angel also brings a message saying, worship God for the hour of judgment has come. And I'll read that in verse seven. He said in a loud voice, fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment has come and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. But then we hear from another angel. In the next slide, in verse 8, we have another angel, a second, followed, saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Now, when we look around the world at the moment, we don't see God's rule we see what, what are some of the things that are happening in the world at the moment that are out of control? War, earthquakes. And I was reading yesterday about the war in Gaza and how basically they've stopped all supplies coming into the country, so fresh water, food, medical supplies. And so you have children who are starving to death, children who, and adults, who are dying from treatable medical causes because they just can't get the medical needs that they they require. And in the Ukraine, we have war that's been going on for how many years now? And people, people there are suffering. But we don't have to look so far away. I was reading that in Australia, one out of every three women has suffered physical violence and one in every five women has suffered sexual violence and that more than half of these are due to somebody being drunk and hurting them. So we have problems in Australia too with injustice and with basic lack of God's rule Would you like to see justice come? Yeah. And the message of this angel is that Babylon is full. And now Babylon is used as a metaphor in Revelation for all of the powers that stand against God and his rule. Um, We also see the image of a beast, of a woman, of a city, all that stand against God. And this just represents all of the powers that are opposed to God and seek to rule the world and demand our allegiance. And when you look around the world, Babylon really does seem to have all the power. And it reminds me of Psalm 73, where the psalmist said, you know, I could see the wicked prospering. I've got it here, I'll just read it. I could see the prosperity of the wicked. They have no pain, their bodies are sound and sleek. They're not in trouble as others are. They're not plagued like other people. Pride is their necklace and violence covers them like a garment. We're seeing plenty of violence. They scoff and speak with malice. They set their mouths against heaven. The people turn and praise them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? And that's sometimes what it feels like when we look around our world. Things are out of control and we're like, does God know? But... Revelation 14, verse 7, sorry, verse 8, tells us that God knows and that Babylon is fallen. It's a promise. It says, don't be fooled by what's going on in the world. I know what's going on and I've got a plan to bring this to an end. Babylon is fallen. Its days are numbered. Just wait and see. And so that brings us back to what that first angel said, that we shouldn't 
bow in fear to Babylon. Instead, we should fear God and give him the glory. Fear the one who made the heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. But this brings us up to the third angel. And these angels have all got good news, believe it or not. Who, who doesn't believe me? Anyone doesn't believe me? Let me read what the third angel says. Another angel, a third, followed them, crying with a loud voice, those who worship the beast and its image and receive a mark on their foreheads or on their hands. They will also drink the wine of God's wrath, which is poured unmixed into the cup of his anger. They will be tormented with fire and sulphur in the presence of holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. There is no rest day or night for those who worship the beast and its image or for anyone who receives the mark of its name. Here is a call for the endurance of the saints, those who keep the commandments of God and hold fast to the faith of Jesus. Does that sound like good news? <laughs> So we've just looked at Babylon. Babylon, the beast, Satan, they don't want people to worship God. They're attacking God's commandments in every way that you can imagine. You can just have to look around our world and you can't see any of God's commandments being upheld. And we're told in those verses that some of them who worship, those who worship the beast in its image will receive a mark on their forehead and that indicates that they've chosen this. They've chosen to follow the beast. They've given their assent. But others receive the mark on their hand. And it's more, more like they're just going along with it. They can see this is what's going on in the world and why fight it? Let's just go with the world and see what we can get out of it. The path of least resistance. But the consequence of this is pretty dire. In verse 10, they will drink the wine of God's wrath poured unmixed into the cup of his anger. It doesn't sound very good. And I just want to look at what the Bible has to say about the cup of God's wrath on the next slide. I think it's the next slide, Jeremiah. I'm sorry, I've got to read that. Jeremiah 25 verse 15 says, Take from my hand this cup of the wine of wrath, and make all the nations to whom I send you drink it. And going on, it says, How can you possibly avoid punishment? You shall not go unpunished. I am summoning a sword against all the inhabitants of the earth. And he is entering into judgment with all flesh, and the guilty he will put to the sword. So this cup of God's wrath sounds pretty serious. And throughout the Old Testament, when there's war and famine and disease, it's often talked about as being the cup of God's wrath. Wars and disasters are shown as being the consequence of sin in our world. I don't know about you, but I don't, I don't want to drink that cup. A bit like Zach didn't want to drink my sauce concoction there. I don't, I don't want to drink that cup. Does anybody want to drink the cup of God's wrath here? No? What kind of God would ask us to drink that cup? The Bible tells us that God doesn't actually want any of us to drink that cup. In Ezekiel, chapter 33, I'm going to read it again, sorry, my eyesight's not that good. As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their ways and live. Turn back, turn back from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? So God doesn't want us to drink that cup. It tells us that he doesn't take pleasure in the death even of those who are wicked. He wants all of us to turn and to know him. He wants all of us to heed this warning. But he went further than just asking us to turn. If we have a look at Matthew chapter 26... Verses 36 to 46, we see Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. And it tells us that he threw himself on the ground 
and he prayed, My father, if it is possible, take this cup from me, but not what you but not what I want, but what you want. And I've got a picture there of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it looks like he's praying, maybe he's a bit upset, but I don't think that picture really cuts it. I was trying to get a picture of Jesus looking very anguished in the Garden of Gethsemane and um, I I couldn't quite generate it very well with the AI program I was using. Um, But I think that in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus wasn't there, you know, God, take this cup from me. I think that was a cry, cry of his, the depth of his very being. Father, if it's possible, take this cup from me. He didn't want to drink that cup either. He knew what it meant. He knew, Jesus knew that to drink that cup meant to take on my sin. It meant to take on your sin. It meant to take on the sin of every person in the world today and everyone living in this world, past and future as well. And he understandably didn't want to drink that cup. But Jesus knew that to drink that cup would take our sin. He knew that to drink that cup would make us right with God. He knew that if he took that wrath of God, that we wouldn't have to. Just like if I drank that awful cup of sauce, then then Zach wouldn't have to. And so Jesus was betrayed soon after this prayer by a friend, someone he'd spent years of his life with very closely. And he was taken then before the Jews and Jesus had done nothing wrong. He was innocent. They had to make up charges against him and he was taken before the Romans. The Romans didn't know what to do with him because they looked at Jesus and they knew he was innocent and yet they bowed to the pressure and sent him to be crucified. And on the cross... Jesus called out, My God, why have you forsaken me? And we're told that the earth was blanketed in darkness, the sun was covered. Because Jesus, at that time, had fully taken on all of our sin and was fully experiencing God's wrath. He was drinking that cup of wrath as it says in Revelation, unmixed. There was no mercy, there was no grace in that cup of God's wrath. Jesus drank it all to the very, very last dregs and as such was cut off from the presence of his his very father. And instead, Jesus offers us a different cup. When he met with his disciples for that last supper, he took a cup and after giving thanks, he said to them, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood, the blood of my covenant, which I poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So Jesus is offering. He's offering to drink this cup for us, the cup of God's wrath. And instead, he's offering us a cup full of grace, a cup full of forgiveness. And it goes on in Romans chapter 5 to say, but God proves his love for us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Much more surely then, now that we've been justified by the blood, we will be saved through him, from what? From the wrath of God. So when I read that verse in Revelation chapter 14, they will also drink the wine of God's wrath. And I put that together with Romans 5, that we will be saved through him, from the wrath of God. 
I realise that Jesus has drunk that cup. And there's no need, there's no need for me to drink that cup. There's no need for you to drink that cup. There's no need for anyone in our world to drink that cup. And God doesn't want them to. God longs for everyone to listen to this. This is the best news ever that these angels bring us. The news of Jesus and what he's done is the best news that our world could ever have. But God won't force us to choose to drink the cup of grace and forgiveness. Zach could have chosen to drink the hot sauce, which may or may not actually be pureed strawberries. But <laughs> and I wouldn't have stopped him. Um, and God won't stop us. He won't force our choice. But he offers us his cup of grace and forgiveness. And the book of Revelation tells us from verse 9 onwards in in chapter 14 that there's going to come a time when that choice is going to have to be made. We're going to have to choose to drink the cup of grace and forgiveness. And that's always, always portrayed as a choice that we make consciously. In Revelation chapter 7, we were looking at in our Sabbath school today, we choose We choose to belong to God. We choose to become his, to drink that cup of grace and forgiveness. And in doing so, to be sealed with God's ownership, to be sealed with his character. It's a definite choice then to go on for a life where we serve him and we keep his commandments. Or we can choose either deliberately or just by going along with the flow. to go along with what's happening in our world, to go along with what's happening in Babylon. And in doing so, we choose to drink that cup of wrath. So my, my challenge for you today is to think about the two cups that are before you. One of them is a cup that leads to death and the other one is a cup that contains life. Which cup are you going to choose? Let's pray. God, I just thank you that even though I deserve that cup of wrath, I deserve your anger and judgment, Lord, And each of us do, Lord. I just thank you that you loved us so much that you sent Jesus who died in our place and who offers us instead the cup of your grace, the cup of your forgiveness. And Lord, I just ask that you'll help each of us to understand that choice fully and to fully commit our lives to you, Lord, that we might experience that grace and forgiveness and be freed from that wrath. Ask this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.